Hi, I'm Neil Gershenfeld. I direct uh, MIT's Center for Bits and Atoms, and I chair the Fab Foundation. And I want to talk about the future of AI and how the digital world relates to the physical world. So as background, the Center for Bits and Atoms was created to look at the boundary between digital and physical. And we've done things like creating the first significant faster than classical quantum computations or creating synthetic life research right at that boundary. And as background, one of my students, uh, Jason Taylor, built and runs all the computers at Facebook. Uh, one of my students, Rafi Krikorian, built the computers for Twitter and then led the reboot of computing for the Democratic National Committee. Uh, one of my students, Ben Recht, uh, won the Test of Time Award from NIPS, the big annual AI meeting. And all of that, I'm not really a computer scientist, and they're not computer scientists, but they could do that because they learned how to believe in physics, not computing, in a sense. Because computer science, the theory, violates laws of physics. And once you understand how they relate, you can do the kind of work I'm describing. So with that background, it appears we're now in an AI revolution. That's what this meeting and a lot of attention is about. But it's important to be aware that we're really in about the fifth boom-bust cycle, that there have been these cycles of AI is going to solve all the problems, then AI is going to fail, then it's going to solve and fail. And we've been through about five of those. What that boom-bust misses is the scaling. And so year by year, processors have gotten faster, the memory you can process has increased, the data you can store has increased, the data you can collect over networks has increased. And so when you add all of that up together, what it means is a brain does about 10 to the 17 operations per second, if you count the number of neurons and the rate they fire. And a supercomputer now today does about 10 to the 17 operations per second. And so the computers have caught up to a brain in the number of operations they can perform. And we would be fundamentally derelict in our duty if at that point the computers weren't beginning to do things comparable to the brain. The real thing that happened wasn't a breakthrough. It was the steady scaling increases so computers are matching the complexity of our brain. That's what's really leading to the uh, results in AI today. Uh, the steady scaling in processing speed, storage, uh, networks. But AI has a mind-body problem because it doesn't have a body, essentially. And so what's missed in those numbers is the supercomputer doing 10 to the 17 operations a second is made out of about 10 to the 17 parts. If you count, so 10 followed by 17 zeros, if you count the transistors. A billion dollar chip factory can make that many transistors in a month to produce all the parts you need. Uh, a person, you listening to this, is doing that every second. So you're full of manufacturing machines, molecular machines called ribosomes, and they're placing 10 to the 17 parts every second. And so, as you're sitting there listening to this, every second you're making the complexity of a supercomputer. And that, that's done at the heart of that is through a process called morphogenesis, which is how genes give rise to physical form. Now that may sound a little remote from artificial intelligence, but two of the fathers of computing, one is Alan Turing, who gave us mo the modern models of computation, the, this is the last thing he studied. Uh, he studied how genes give rise to form. And uh, John von Neumann, who gave us modern computer architecture, uh, the last thing he studied was self-reproducing machines, how a machine can communicate a computation for its own construction. And so this is the literal mother of all AI problems. It's the evolution of AI itself. How did intelligence create intelligence? And that didn't come from the brain thinking. It came from molecular intelligence. And so the way morphogenesis works 
is in one of the oldest parts of the genome, there's a program. And it, it, in the sense you think of as a computer program. But it's a computer program that gives rise to form. And so your genome doesn't store things like you have five fingers. It stores a program that re produces five fingers. And that may sound like a detail, but it's profound. One reason is a billion bases in your genome can specify a trillion cells. But the deeper reason is almost anything you did to the genome would either be fatal or inconsequential. But changes to these developmental programs are interesting. You can go from five to six fingers, or fingers to webs, or walking to um, flapping. And this is exactly the heart of AI. So what AI does is find representations. How you search for data hasn't really changed. What these AI algorithms do is represent where it's an interesting place to search. And so in the same sense, evolution searches over programs that create life by finding a beautiful representation for this evolutionary search. And so this was the breakthrough of the year last year in science, according to Science Magazine. And it really is artificial intelligence, but it's natural intelligence. It's embodied in your molecules, and it's what creates life. It's what creates our intelligence. So now, the connection to this meeting and the heart of what I want to talk about is to look now ahead at the scaling. And so we're really living through a third digital revolution that the unites the first two. So the first one was in communication. We used to send analog waves down a wire and they degraded with distance. Um, uh, Shannon, uh, Claude Shannon showed if you communicate digitally, uh, if the error is below a threshold, the noise reduces exponentially. And what that means is unreliable devices can communicate reliably. And that observation gave us the internet. Uh, John von Neumann built on that to show you can have an unreliable computing device, but it can do a reliable computation, again, by detecting and correcting errors. So the first two digital revolutions were digital communication and computation which at heart means reliable operation with unreliable devices. Uh, that was kind of enshrined in Gordon, what came to be called Moore's Law. Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, in 1965 plotted five data points for the transistors on a chip. And he showed if you take the logarithm, they line up on a straight line. And a straight line on a logarithm plot means something is doubling. So it's going from one to two to four to eight. And so he saw it look like this was doubling, and he projected what if that happens for 10 years. And in fact, his projection was wrong, it went for 50 years. And so that came to be known as Moore's Law, and the scaling of Moore's Law is what's led to the digital revolutions transforming the world, and it led to the scaling I described that led to computers matching the complexity, of, you know, reaching the complexity of a human brain, the, the largest computers. So the heart of what I want to talk about is the same thing is now happening for going from digital to physical. And this has come to be called Lass's Law, after Sherry Lassiter, somebody I, I work with. And so we actually have more data than Gordon Moore had to see the same sort of exponential scaling, but now not in digital computing or communication, but in digital fabrication, uh, crossing the boundary from digital to physical. And so to look at the history of that, MIT invented computerized manufacturing in 1952. Uh, but that le led up to the state-of-the-art manufacturing today, the most advanced things like 3D printing. But those are all analog. The computer is digital, but there's no information in materials. Life, four billion years ago, evolved what I described of this process of genes giving rise to form. That's truly digital in the sense of digital computing and communication. And so you can, you can program that directly. My lab was part of a collaboration creating fully synthetic uh, living organisms. But we're learning how to do that in uh, inorganic systems, in engineered materials. And so to trace what that history looks like, uh, around the same time MIT had made that first 
computerized manufacturing machine, it made a computer called the Whirlwind, a few blocks uh, from where we are sitting right now. The Whirlwind filled a building. It was two floors of a building. And it was the first significant real-time computer, a computer that could respond not to a batch of operations, but in real time. And you could trace uh, really all modern computer operating systems uh, grew out of that project. It was very important historically. And there was just one of those. It fills the building. It's the size of a planet. In the same sense, the first computerized manufacturing, there was one of those you know, million dollar uh, initiative. The whirlwind got transistorized at MIT. It was commercialized as the PDP that was a mini computer. And mini computers historically went from filling a building to filling a room. So it would fill about a room of this size. It would cost maybe $100,000, weigh a few tons. And so that was uh, much too big for an individual, but it was smaller than a whole organization. And on mini computers, that's when the internet, email, video games, word processing, all the things you do with modern computing happened when computers reached the level of a work group. The analog for that, for this digital fabrication revolution, is something called Fab Labs. And in a moment, I'll tell you much more about that. So to continue tracing the mini computer that cost $100,000, there are about a thousand of them, thousands of them, and that's roughly one per city. What came after that were hobbyist computers that weren't useful, but they were personal. And Microsoft and Apple and all of those companies grew out of these first hobbyist computers. And so there were millions of those, roughly one per town. And the analog to those isn't just using a machine to make things, but it's actually machines making machines, fab labs making fab labs. Then the computers became truly personal in the era of PCs and smartphones. And there are now billions of those, as many as people on Earth. And the research we're doing for those is going from printing processes or cutting machines to assemblers that can make almost anything in one process, can make things like integrated circuits or all the technology. And today, we've reached what's called the Internet of Things stage, where a smart ther we might have trillions of smart devices, like a thermostat. And the thermostat has the computing power of the mini computer. But now, one person might have thousands of those. And for those, we're working up to things called self-assemblers. And the reason I just skimmed through that is computing numerically went from 1 to 1,000 to a million to a billion to a trillion over a 50-year period, transforming every aspect of how we live. In the same way, I just described how going from digital to physical is going through that same scaling. Each of those stages of 1,000 million, billion, trillion exists today uh, in some form in the laboratory, but it's going to take between now and 50 years in the future for them to emerge. But the implication is not 50 years in the future. So uh, in the same way that the internet and all of that was created in mini computers, as a outreach project initially for the National Science Foundation, we began setting up these fab labs and they fall in between the millions of dollars of tools I run in a lab at MIT and the self-replicating systems far in the future. So the Fab Lab today costs about $100,000. It fills a room like this. It weighs about two tons. And it contains 10 different machines that together read computerized data and do manufacturing. It includes printers and lasers and precision milling and cutting and uh, things like embedding and programming electronics. And once you have those tools, you can make uh, technology that grows food. You can make consumer electronics. You can make furniture. You can make houses, boats, bicycles, clothing. Uh, just about everything you buy as a commercial product today, you can make when you have access to these digital fabrication tools. There are inputs you need. Uh, but what, um, like, you, you can't yet make the integrated circuits. You need the research I described. But with those, you can really make just about anything. And so they're not yet personal. That's coming down in cost. But they're a, a level of a community group. 
And the dramatic thing that happened is we set up a few as an outreach project, and then they've been doubling for the last decade. Every year and a half, the number of these labs double. There's about 1,500 now, and they range from as far north to the top of Norway to the bottom of Africa. They're in rural India. Uh, they're at the bottom tip of South America. Uh, they're in favelas. They're in just about every sort of setting. And so in the same way that uh, Africa got to skip landline phones and largely go to mobile phones, a significant part of the world is skipping the industrial revolution and going to this distributed uh, manufacturing. And that in turn has a number of profound implications. Uh, one is for education. So behind me is MIT's campus, which was added up a few years ago to businesses spun off from here are the world's 10th economy. It falls between the economic output of India and of Russia from these just you know, few square blocks. Uh, it's not because the people here are unusually smart, it's that this is a productive place for them to uh, uh, flourish. And what we're finding is these fab labs all over the world are attracting exactly that profile of bright inventive outliers, exactly the ones we see here, but now in rural African villages or in, in Arctic towns. And so we started a program called the Fab Academy, where instead of traveling a distance to a central campus like this, or instead of looking online at a screen, students have peers in work groups with mentors and machines locally and we connect them with video and content sharing to make an educational network, a distributed educational network that's really growing to tap the brain power of the planet. And so that was one unexpected thing. And then another unexpected thing is the implication for economies and for cities and countries. So Barcelona, for example, has a great design sense, but over 50% youth unemployment. A whole generation can't leave home and work. So my counterpart there, Vicente Gallart, became the uh, city architect, the planner of Barcelona. And he started setting up fab labs in districts around the city. So in the same way you expect the city to provide clean water or electricity, the city is now providing the means to make, the means to produce as part of urban infrastructure. And that launched a fab city initiative of many cities around the world, of uh, Detroit or Oakland or Mexico City or Seoul, signing up to this fab city initiative to turn their consumers into creators with the means to produce. On the scale of a country, uh, Bhutan, for example, is based not on gross domestic product, but on gross national happiness, which doesn't mean they're happy, but it means they measure well-being as the output of the economy. So it's a profound initiative on the scale of a country, but they were limited physically by buying crap trucked in from India and China. And so we're working closely with Bhutan to destroy, deploy these labs throughout uh, the country to take gross national happiness and make it physical. And so among the most sensitive issues right now in the world are diverging income, income inequality, um, uh, tariffs, uh, economic races to the bottom, uh, all that package of news. And if you think about this connection of once you can go from digital to physical, it's fundamentally an end run around it. So digital fabrication is not separate, it completes the first two revolutions. Digital computing is the means to think, digital communication is the means to, to message, digital fabrication lets bits become atoms and atoms become bits. And so if you go into a fab lab and you produce the sort of things you see me around in this office in the lab, uh, it fundamentally changes a series of assumptions. At the heart of these battles of income inequality and tariffs and taxes and all of that is the assumption that uh, you need a job, to ha you need a business to have a job to have work to get money to then be able to purchase something, if you can go into the lab and make something, it fundamentally changes the equality of all of those things and really in a way does an end run around it. Now it's not utopia, 
But if you think about the democratization that's happened in computing uh, and uh, communication, it does the same thing. So you could make something for yourself, you could make it for your community, you could make it for your town. Uh, a wonderful group of fab labs in Detroit, run by Blair Evans, called Insight Focus, has an explicit model of a third of the time in the lab is for traditional economic activity for money. A third is for a post-salary economy that involves barter and exchange and community infrastructure. And a third, like Bhutan, is economic activity, but not for money, but for enrichment, transformation, uh, for improving yourself and your community. Really revisiting these very basic assumptions about what is an economy, what is work, what is money, how do you meet people's needs. In a way, it's a very old idea to break global supply chains and uh, consumption, but it rests on the ability to think globally, to be part of these global networks, but fabricate locally. So in the first two digital revolutions, it took us decades. You, know, you could take Gordon Moore's plot in 1965, but it took us decades to catch up to spam, fake news, viruses, um, uh, differences in access to computing. We don't need to wait a few decades now. Uh, we have a moment right now where we can shape how this revolution is going to unfold. And there's very interesting data points for that. Uh, in the U.S. Congress, in the House, Representatives Foster and Massey, and in the Senate, uh, Senators Van Hollen and Murkowski are introducing a bill to do in the US what Barcelona did, which is universal access to digital fabrication. A new notion of a national laboratory made out of connected local labs. And so in a world where you do that, a lot of what a government does today you don't need. If you just make a product in the lab, the way it's done today, it comes in, say, in a ship to a port, you need a port, you need somebody to build the port, you need uh, to figure out how you uh, tariff the thing coming in, then it needs to go down, say, to a train, then it needs to go to a highway, then it needs to get to a building, and then you need um, a cash register and you need to account for the sale. If you just make it for yourself, you eliminate uh, much of that global supply chain and much of the function of what a government does. On the other hand, if you have the ability to do it yourself, you need a whole bunch of new functions government doesn't do today about empowering and enabling this to make it efficient, effective, safe, and all of that. But in the world where this is so distributed, you can't do it by command and control. You can't legislate it. You have to um, opt in and add value to the networks. And so merging fabrication with communication and computation fundamentally challenges how an economy works. It fundamentally challenges what are the functions of government performs. But it gives a real hopeful opportunity to not keep fighting the same battles we've been fighting for many years, but step around them and empower anybody to make almost anything anywhere. So now to step back and conclude, I started by talking about foundations of computing and how it's led to what seems to be a breakthrough in AI. I then connected with the most profound part of AI for me is not how we think, but how we evolved the ability to think, the creation of thinking. So not just AI, but the create AI that creates AI. That involves intelligence, but it's not simply software. It's a molecular intelligence that goes from digital to physical. We're now learning to build that technology ourselves. It's growing exponentially, and it's one of the most significant and disruptive things I know for the future of the planet. Uh, to do that, uh, we've been initially frustrated by working with schools for education and nonprofits for aid and governments for governance and businesses for economy. And we kept tripping over that because if anybody can make anything anywhere, it breaks all of those boundaries. And so probably the hardest part of this whole story, but the most interesting part, is we've had to build a whole new set of organizations around anybody being able to make anything anywhere. How do you live, learn, work, and play? And so there's a really interesting group of organizational innovators helping lead that story. 
and I'll share some references uh, afterwards uh, with it. Um, one of them is I recently wrote a book with my, called Designing Reality with my younger brother, Alan, who ran the biggest video game studio, and my older brother, Joel, who led the National Labor Relations Organization, tracing out how this uh, many-year technical roadmap relates to the social roadmap for the impact. And so that's what it means for AI to become embodied, AI to become physical, and I invite you to help join us in building that new world. Thank you.